Good morning to everybody. <coughs> Happy Sunday and welcome. Uh, again, we're very glad for each one that's here and for you taking the time to listen to this morning's lesson. Uh, today we're dealing with a two-parter. It's all about back to school. Uh, and I've entitled it Bible School Subjects. Uh, now the fact that school season is back upon us, it, it may bring you some dread, uh, maybe a little apprehension. Maybe you're excited about it. I don't know, and I don't want to tell you to feel one way or the other. But I wanted to talk about learning, uh, talk about education. You know, the first schools that the colonists had here in the New World had the Bible for their textbook. Uh, and it didn't matter what the subject was, they used God's Word to learn it. Uh, and I think it's easy to see, even from a, a casual observer of the Bible, that you can really learn just about anything by looking into God's Word. Uh, now, of course, God's Word wasn't designed to be a history book, although parts of it certainly do tell history. It wasn't designed to be a math textbook, but you'll find great lessons to do with mathematics there. Uh, God has great value for us if we would be eager to learn. Uh, and that's really the heart of what we want to be, what we want to talk about this morning, that we would be eager to learn. Uh, we want to be wise people. We want to live virtuous lives. Of course, we have to look into that precious book divine, like we just sang. Uh, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 9 is where we begin today. Proverbs 9 and verse 9 says, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. And I would hope that every one of us can devote ourselves to being lifelong learners. And you're all familiar with the concept of being a lifelong learner, because you've heard the phrase, learn something new every day. And that's what we want to do. We want to learn something new every day to make sure we're continuing our education, keeping our minds active and healthy. Uh, and I would challenge you not just to learn something new every day, but perhaps learn something useful every day. Uh, you know, sometimes we hear that phrase and we get some random fact of trivia. We say, ah, I learned something new today. Okay, but how does that help you? <laughs> Is that something beneficial? Is that something useful? Uh, I've been accused of knowing some, some random useless facts. Uh, maybe you have too. Let's strive to learn useful things. Let's strive to learn the things God wants us to know. Uh, we do want to grow in our education. Uh, we do want to be able to apply this knowledge day by day. Uh, and if you think about school, the different subjects in school, we can use them as a guide to help grow in our spiritual education from God's Word. So for our purposes today, we're going to use different school subjects, uh, talk about some important biblical lessons as they relate to them. Uh, the way I've broken this down, I think we're taking three subjects this morning and then three tonight. So you'll have to come back for, for part two. Uh, okay, first class, reading. Uh, now I chose reading, I think, maybe because I was thinking about the TOS test and the way that was broken down. Uh, but really you can substitute writing, English, grammar, literature, language arts. There's a lot of different names that go for this subject, right? Uh, and this is the class, I think, where my brother really excelled. Uh, my older brother, he's, he's skilled. He's a writer. He's a poet. He's got a way with words. Uh, I can't write like he writes. Uh, it seems like he would always excel past me in, in anything to do with English or language arts. Uh, as we think about reading, this is really the most basic application. Uh, you know, to tie this subject into Bible learning, it's very easy. Uh, read the Bible. <laughs> the song we sang not too long ago, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? Uh, by giving heed to the Word of God, uh, reading His Word. Uh, and I'm going to start at what might seem a, a, an odd point in a little way. Uh, the kings of Israel had specific instructions regarding the law. Uh, if you look to Deuteronomy 17, uh, beginning there in verse 18, and we'll read down to verse 20. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. So writing and reading, already emphasized right there. Uh, and it continues, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children, in the midst of Israel. Now it's an important point, and these weren't instructions for one specific king in Israel, but all the kings. 
Now, I think it's clear from a reading of the Old Testament that not every king did it. Uh, There are some very wicked kings who didn't regard God and His law, uh, who brought in idols and worshipped them, especially as you think about the northern kingdom, but it was true in the south as well. Uh, But look at this open-ended instruction to write a copy of the law and to read it so that every king would be very familiar with God's instruction. Uh, And one of the best things that you and I can do uh, is read God's Word. Uh, And as we're trying to read it and take it in and make application, one thing that helps us oftentimes is to write it out. Uh, When I was in school at at Southwest, we had to memorize Acts chapter 2. And don't ask me to quote it today because it's left my brain since. But as I was trying to memorize that, the way I did it is I wrote it. I had a notebook and I wrote Acts 2 over and over and over and over again. And when it came time for the test, I knew it because I had read it and I had written it. Uh, This is a great way to get our brains engaged, get ourselves involved with the text. Uh, And it's clear that it would be important for someone like a king in Israel here in the Old Testament day. Uh, But don't you think that would be important for us today? Uh, We're meant to be ambassadors of Christ, His representatives to others to show what it means to be a Christian servant. We know what a problem it is when Christians aren't familiar with God's Word. Uh, There's a big disconnect and you end up living in hypocrisy. Uh, So read the law. Understand it. Uh, There's a great saying, Reading is to the mind what exercise is to the body. Uh, If you don't exercise, your body becomes weak. Uh, You would grow uh, very passive, very lethargic through this process. But when you exercise, you grow strong. You're able to do more. Uh, Some people who live to uh, very, very old age, beyond 100 years, uh, you look to their lives and you'll find they're very active. Longevity tied to that. Well, we want the same for our mental state. We want the same for our brain. Well, how do you do that? You have to keep your brain active. Uh, Keep it moving. Keep it alive. Keep thinking. In other words, uh, don't stop that process. Uh, You know, one of the, the great secrets, I think, to living the Christian life is to be a reader. Uh, And you think about it, if we never read, if we never read just for fun, just in our free time, that skill diminishes. Uh, Well, our reading skill is very important. That's what we do. We open up God's Word. It contains what we need to know for life, our instruction. If we never use that skill, it's not a very honed, it's not a very practiced skill. We're not good readers. Uh, And so reading in in any realm would, uh, on any topic, would increase our brain power, would increase our skill for reading, so we're better able to approach the Word of God. Uh, Look at this quotation from Matthew 19. Uh, Here we find Christ teaching on marriage. Uh, Matthew 19, starting in verse 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Verse 5, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Uh, The quotation from Genesis. Uh, Verse 6, So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Uh, Now you can read a little bit more in Matthew 19, and you can see there's uh, some questions about divorce. There's some issues about who can put away their spouse and who can't. Uh, But when Jesus begins to address this topic, he starts at a very basic point, and it has to do with reading. Uh, Have you read God's will on marriage? Have you read about the first marriage, Adam and Eve, and how God put them together, one man, one woman, for life, the two becoming one flesh? And that very basic beginning point, have you not read? Uh, points to the power of opening up God's Word. Uh, In other words, he says, you can know this. You don't have to sit and wonder with this question mark above your head. Look into the Bible. The answer is there. Uh, There was another occasion we see Jesus use this tactic uh, in Luke 10, starting in verse 25. This is where we see the greatest command. Uh, Luke 10, beginning at 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28, And he said to him, You have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. Now take just that statement at the end from verse 28. Jesus speaking with this man, the the lawyer there, he says, You have answered right. Jesus says, correct. Wouldn't every one of us like to be in those shoes 
Uh, you know, to have the Lord, the King of Kings there, and say, you answered right. Uh, now here there's uh, a question about his intention, because the lawyer's testing him. Uh, but just for a minute, take that away. Suppose we're there, we give an answer, and Jesus says, correct. Isn't that a great feeling? Uh, you know, talking about the school setting, you take some test that was really hard, you studied for it, you get the paper back, and right across the top, 100, great job. Isn't that an amazing feeling? Don't you get a, a high from that just to look and see, I was right. Uh, well, here as Jesus describes that good end, you've answered rightly, do this and you will live, it all started with two basic questions. What's written in the law and what's your reading of it? Uh, have you read what is written, in other words? Have you seen God's law on this matter? And there are so many problems in the world today that could easily be solved if we would put all of our opinions behind, if we would leave traditions and not use them as a standard of authority, and simply say, what is written? Uh, what has God said? Uh, and so many issues within the church, talking about doctrinal issues, have become worse and worse because no one has stopped and taken the group and said, let's get back to the Bible. Let's read together what God says. He's the only one who has the authority to speak on this matter, uh, to uh, lay out what is right and what is wrong. And that's exactly where we want to be. Uh, and so reading is essential for the Christian life. We see it in Bible school, uh, and it's a great school subject. Uh, now, next class, number two. I want to take a minute to talk about art. Uh, now, as you might lay out a lesson like this, people would have a tendency, I think, to skip over art. You say, well, art class, that's not really education. That's just kind of extracurricular. That's just fun for those creative people, right? Uh, no, there's a, an important lesson to be learned here. Uh, we actually talked a little bit about this uh, last Sunday night. This is my father's world, talking about the words of that song. Uh, and as we talked about God as the creator, you can see his appreciation for beauty. Uh, his love for art and our learning in the realm of art, I believe, brings us closer to the mind of God. Uh, a few passages on this. Look to Psalm 19 and verse 1. Psalm 19 and verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Uh, one of the ways that God communicates with us is through His creation. Uh, he does speak through that, and as it talks about here, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, there is enough so that man would look and see, yes, there must be a creator. Uh, and he must be an intelligent designer and he must be a loving God. Uh, one of the things we're looking at today, thinking about creation, uh, is how good it is to see the rain. Uh, what a great reminder, not just that God is in control, but that God loves beauty because the rain comes and what happens? Well, things green up again. You can see that fresh life. You can see that newness, that rejuvenation that comes about with God's blessing. Uh, in Psalm 95, beginning there in verse 3, it says, For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are His also. Verse 5 says, The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands form the dry land. Uh, we all need the reminder that everything ultimately belongs to God. And sometimes it's easy to get distracted and to think about our bank account or our wallet and say, Well, this, this belongs to me. Well, all of our resources really depend on rain, sunshine, and time. All these things come from God. Uh, and it's clear that He is the originator of us. He's our creator. And so if He makes us and He makes everything that we have and everything that we enjoy, of course it all belongs to Him. Uh, which makes it so much easier, not just for us to come in line with His way of thinking, but to say, I need to give back to God what is His. Uh, and I need to be a good steward of what He has entrusted to me, the resource and the blessing that He sees fit to give me. Uh, when you look to Psalm 107, uh, this is one of those great psalms where you find repetition used as a teaching tool. Uh, and I'm going to read for you verse 8, uh, but it could just as easily be 15, 21, or 31. Each one of those verses has the same text here. Psalm 107, verse 8 says, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Uh, and this is the beauty that we're talking about, and this is where art class really fits in. Uh, what's missing so often is appreciation for the artist, uh, giving thanks to the Creator, the one who set all these blessings for us, the one who laid out creation, placed it just so according to His pattern, according to His design. Uh, I think people today should echo the words of this psalm, Oh, that men would give thanks to God. So often they don't, but we all should. 
And it's repeated, like we said, again, 15, 21, and 31, each one of those verses saying the same thing. And so as the psalmist goes on, he stops every little bit of the way and says, we need to be giving thanks to God. For His goodness, one, but it also says, for His wonderful works to the children of men. Uh, God has done wonderful things for us. Uh, And it's a shame that we would see all those blessings go by and not take the opportunity to show our gratitude. Uh, Yes, verbally to thank Him, but also thank Him by our actions, what we choose to do. Uh, The idea of art, I think, is also seen in God's role as uh, the master potter. Uh, If you look to Isaiah 64 and verse 8, uh, I think we're familiar with this analogy from Scripture. Isaiah 64, 8 says, But now, O Lord, You are our Father, we are the clay, and You are potter, and all... Uh, and all we are the work of your hand. Uh, Understanding that God created us, God sets things in motion for us, gives us opportunity, places us in certain situations. Uh, And think for just a minute about the amazing work uh, of these types of artists, those who would uh, throw pottery on the the turntable, the amazing work of of skilled men and women. Uh, I learned a new word this week. This might qualify as useless knowledge, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Ceramicist. I didn't know that was a word, but one who makes ceramics, an artist who works in this media, uh, a ceramicist. Uh, And so you think about something like this creation, someone who's created a a picture, not just working with the clay, but even decorating it afterwards, this beautiful style. You wouldn't look at this and say, well, that was just found out in the dirt somewhere. Well, no, someone made that. Someone created it and did so with care, Uh, not just to make it beautiful, but to make it functional so that it can serve man, so that it can be used for people's good. Uh, And it's much harder than it looks to work with clay. I've seen people do it, and some of you have experience with it. It can be a very difficult task. Uh, But God in His mastery, uh, not just working us, but working the world, the situation, the kingdoms of men, He's always working to bring about uh, what is for the best good. Uh, Isaiah 45 and verse 9 Uh, talks about this rebellious attitude. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, he has no hands? Uh, And this is what we're talking about. You know, earlier with that psalm, oh, that men would give thanks to God. So often, mankind is not giving thanks. We're rebelling against him. Uh, We're looking at that beautiful work, that creation that he has made, and we're saying, random chance. Uh, Mankind saying evolution did all this. There was no loving care. There's no intelligent designer. And over and over the blessings that come, daily reminders of God's ownership and God's power like rain that comes and blesses the earth. Uh, Rain falls on the just and the unjust. God is kind to even the unthankful, even the evil, even those who look to Him and say, you have no skill or who deny His very existence. Uh, But our attitude should surely be to recognize Him. If you look to Psalm 77, beginning there in verse 11, and this is the last one on this point, Psalm 77 and verse 11 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. And that's what we want to do, to remember. Don't let it drop out of your mind. Don't forget. Then verse 12, I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. Uh, And so we're centering our mind on God and what He has done, the beauty of creation, seeing God as the master artist. And notice, talking about His deeds to tell others, not just about creation, but His will to be with that creation for eternity. Uh, And what that means, His plan of salvation for us to save us from our sins. Uh, Verse 13 has this statement, Who is so great a God as our God? Uh, The implied answer, no one. And then verse 14, You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. Uh, Now there are various and different works that people want to call wonders. Uh, You might think about the wonders of the world, things like the pyramids, and you say, well, isn't that a a marvelous thing? The Great Wall of China, a great structure, a feat of engineering. But none of these works of man compare to the wonders of God. Uh, It just can't compare. It's not in the same league. Uh, God, as the master artist, sets himself apart. Truly the one who does wonders, the one who declares his strength. And our reaction to that should be to remember it, to meditate on it, and to tell others uh, of our master artist, our God. Uh, Now third class, and and this is the best one I think for today to talk about. Uh, Let's talk about mathematics. Uh, Now math is a a great subject, and I have to say that because my mom's a math teacher. 
But even if she wasn't, I would probably still say it. Uh, I mentioned my brother excelling in English class. One thing that always bugged me, when you're in English class, you write an essay or something like that, your grade is variable dependent on the mood of the teacher and, and how it might strike them as they're reading that essay. And it's all very subjective because one teacher might read it and say, ah, oh, this is a very good essay. I'm going to give you a good grade. The other one might read it and say, oh, I see some issues here and there. Let's mark that down a little bit. But math is not that way. Math has certainty. Math has absolutes. Two plus two is four. And it's clear that if you put four, you are correct. It's clear if you put something other than four, you are incorrect. I like the certainty of math. I appreciate that. If you look to Romans 8 and verse 31, I think this is a great place to begin our discussion of math as we want to see it in light of Bible teaching. Romans 8, 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? When we talk about math in relation to Bible teaching, I think we need to talk about a standard of authority not coming from popular opinion. Uh, the idea of if enough people agree, it must be true. That doesn't line up with Scripture. Uh, scripture teaches that God is the only standard of authority. Uh, let me show you an equation to think about, and it's not really an equation, uh, it's an inequality. Uh, and that's an expression that uses the greater than, less than symbol. And I know you're familiar with it. When I learned about it, we thought of it as a little alligator. And the alligator goes for the bigger number. And so the mouth is open towards the greater, uh, the greater than. And so this inequality that I have for us, one plus God is greater than X. You are the one. The X is opposition. And it doesn't matter if you've got one person opposing you. It doesn't matter if you have 10,000 people. It doesn't matter if you have a billion people opposing you. If you are on the side of God, you are on the greater power. You are in the side of the majority. And really, this expression is not even the best way to put it because you could remove the one entirely, and it's still true. God is greater than X, and use any number for X. It's still true. But let this be a comfort to you. When you feel like there are too many wicked people in the world, when you feel like there are too many enemies around, saying that the Bible is not true, saying that Christ shouldn't be trusted, saying that Christians are, are foolish for having faith in something like this, even one with God is the majority against any number. Uh, look to Psalm 27. The same is expressed here from verse 1 and also verse 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Uh, we don't want to quake in fear because of the number uh, of op opposition that we might have. Uh, verse 3 says, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me in this, I will be confident. And I want you to think about that phrasing from verse 3. Even though an army encamps against me, I'm still confident in God. Uh, my heart's not afraid, even when there's war going on, because I trust in God's power to deliver. Uh, now think about someone who lived this exactly in their life. Gideon. Uh, Gideon is one of my favorite Bible heroes, one of the best stories, I think, to read about, especially on this topic. Uh, we see him in the book of Judges, and he is one of the judges, uh, elevated by God to deliver the people of Israel from the oppression of the Midianites. And if there's one thing seen in the life and the story of Gideon, I think it's God's lesson in math. Uh, look to Judges 7 here in verse 2. Here we see God's lesson on math. Judges 7 and verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now think about this prospect here. We've got Gideon who's elevated to this position. The Spirit of God's with him. He's going to be a judge. He's going to defeat the, the Midianites, and Israel's going to be uh, back in power again, back independent, not under their yoke again. So he gets a little bit of an army together, and God says, You've got too many men, Gideon. Your army's too great. And he gives a very specific reason, and I hope you see it there in the text. He says there are too many, lest Israel claim glory for itself, saying, My own hand has saved me. As God gives his lesson in math, he wants a very important principle to be laid down. And it really works on both sides 
both Israel and the Midianites learn a really powerful lesson here. One is to inspire the Israelites to trust in God's might. That is not them that won this victory, that it will be God who gives the victory. And secondly, a powerful lesson to the Midianites to put the fear of the Lord and His people into them, to understand that He is the one true living God, not like all the idols among the people of the day. So let's take a minute to do the math. Gideon's army versus the Midianites. Uh, now the Midianite army, uh, as you look carefully through this text, something about 120,000. So that's the opposing force, okay? About 120,000. Well, Gideon's army, the original one, was 32,000 men. Uh, and this is the group that God said, they are too many for me to give the victory to them. And so God instructs Gideon to tell the army, anyone who would like to go home, go back to their families, you may do so. Okay, 22,000 leave. So at this point, he's got 10,000. And God says, still too many. So God instructs Gideon to take the army down to the water and there to get a drink. And God instructs Gideon to separate the soldiers who pull up the water and lap it from their hands. Okay, so this eliminates quite a few. 9,700 are cut out, separated in this group now. What remains are 300. And God says, by the 300 who lapped, these are the ones who I will use to give Israel the victory. Now remember the Midianite army, something like 120,000. And so even the original force of 32,000 that Gideon had, it was going to be an insane mismatch. It was going to be a very difficult battle, right, for 32,000 to take on 120,000? But no, God says, just 300. And you remember the lesson, so that they would know it is God's power that gives the victory. And so you read further through the account, you go to Judges 7 and verse 20. Judges 7 and verse 20, and at this point they have split the 300 into three groups, 100 each. It says, Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now Gideon is the Lord's servant here. He's the one elevated to be the judge. But I want to highlight just the beginning of this battle cry. The sword of the Lord. Imagine this battlefield if it was the sword of Israel. You would have three groups of a hundred guys going into the Midianite camp and getting slaughtered easily. That's the sword of Israel. If you and I try and do things by ourselves today to be independent, self-sufficient, not to rely on God, it's the sword of me, and I go out and I get defeated. But where we should put our trust, of course, is in God. And so, the sword of the Lord. And there's a great victory. Because they follow God's instructions uh, to whittle down the army, and because they follow God's battle plan to come up against this camp where the Midianites are, Scripture says this 120,000 strong group of Midianites, they wake up in a panic. Some of them are running away. Some of them are killing each other. They're terrified at what's going on. And not a single man from the 300 that Gideon has is lost. God gives them a great victory. They put 120,000 men to flight. That's God's lesson on math. 300 with God, an easy majority. The Midianites could have had 10 times the number of men. God would still give them the victory. And it would still be just as powerful. Uh, to wrap this point up, look at Psalm 118 and verse 6. Psalm 118 and verse 6. This is such an important application. It says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Satan works so often through fear. You know, fear is where chaos reigns. The idea of growing timid because of opposition. Being intimidated because of the strength of the wicked. That's exactly what the devil wants for you. But if we say the sword of the Lord, if we rely on Him and make sure that we're living right, make sure that we're with Him, right, we can see this power. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Now, you've heard me talk before about the message from heaven. And it doesn't matter if it's one of God's angels or if it's Jesus Himself. So often in Scripture, the message from heaven is... Be not afraid. And you'll see it almost every time there's a heavenly messenger, every time there's an angel, almost every time Jesus has to speak with someone in a situation like this, be not afraid. 
or do not fear, some form of that same sentiment. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power that rests in what He equips us with, that relies on His strength, that trusts in Him. So that's God's lesson on math. Uh, Okay, that's it for now. Consider yourself on lunch break. Uh, We've got three more subjects coming up for the rest of our Bible school subject day. Uh, Now let's talk about what we have for tonight. Uh, The three subjects for tonight, we're talking about science, talking about history, and then finally, gym, uh, PE or athletics. Uh, Submit the the word you'd like to use there. Uh, But as we said at the start, it is back to school season. Uh, That might bring excitement, it might bring dread. Uh, I don't know what it might bring for you, but one thing is consistent. We must be diligent students of God's word. Uh, You know, studying God and and learning a a spiritual education, it's not something that you begin and then finish and then you retire and you're done. Uh, You may have left your school days long behind you, but your Bible school days continue. Uh, We don't take summer break either. Uh, We continue in our spiritual education. We continue to learn from God. Uh, And we, we all need to be challenging ourselves to be lifelong learners to continue to grow in uh, our spiritual development, to grow in our application of true biblical wisdom. Uh, So as we've talked about today, the importance of reading, uh, adhering to the Word of God, that is our standard of authority. Uh, We've also talked about art, seeing God as the master artist, the beauty of creation and His ownership of all things. Uh, And then also math and the important lesson that even one with God uh, has the majority, has the victory. Uh, Being on His side is what truly matters. Uh, If you need the prayers of the congregation or if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation this morning, you can do so as together we stand and sing.